This time on the show, Kevin Mitnick is in the house with his missile whistle to answer questions from us and you. Then preventing file clobbering with Miss Type Wakas, all that and more, this time on Hack 5. This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com, Carbonite, and Jack Threads. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morris. Your weekly dose of Technolust. I am so excited this week. Why are you excited? Because we have an awesome guest in studio with us. Kevin Mitnick is joining us. Really the missile whistle? Shut up. It was funny. Come okay. on. It was funny. I, know, I like it. I like it. It's like, it's like casting magic missiles. The missile whistle. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly I want to play D&D. Anyway. But yeah, Sky. so you're excited because uh, I, I got to say, I was watching the interview. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Yes. You, I enjoyed it too. It got like mad XP I mean, the book was up. awesome, so I was really excited to discuss, discuss it with him. But. And if you're totally missing out on that and you don't know who Kevin... Mitnick is, you're about to find Just stay out. Tuned. Yeah. If you know and you're a hater, that's cool. This one's not your episode. But otherwise, I'm really stoked because, I am you too. know, I grew up <laughs> in the phone freaking scene and that's really cool. So I hear we have a gift. We do have a gift. A gift from a fan. Or as we know it as, the new Can What's in the Box okay. segment. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yay. All right. Have you seen what's in here? Yeah, I have. I haven't seen it. This is a gift for all of us from our friends in Ireland. Aoife and Rob, otherwise known as Archiver. Oh my god! And yeah, we got Cadbury chocolates. Oh. There's one for Paul, and there's one for me, and there's one for you, and Jason Applebaum's back there, and he's looking at this one. I, we're gonna have to save this for Kirby, so I'll take Yum. both of these. Kirby can't eat chocolate. Oh, Don't you right. dare give actually, her chocolate, I'll hurt you. Are not supposed to do that? No. Oh, okay. Don't give cats chocolate, that's a Thank big no-no. Thank you, Archiver. Oh my god. Thank you, Aoife. I am so excited. You know what? Just let's cancel the episode. I gotta go eat this. this All right. Well, then we'll make it a quick A block, and um, go ahead and uh, throw to Shannon with her wonderful Sorry. interview with Kevin Mitnick, and we'll see you guys at the end of the show. And hopefully, she won't have eaten all the chocolate and be like. Bah! Today, I am so excited to have Kevin Mitnick in the studio. Now, Kevin, you are known as the world's greatest, most wanted hacker. So I have a question. Okay. Can you really hack NORAD and fire off missiles? Well, you know, you know the old adage, if I told you, I'd have to kill you, but oh. I don't want to do that. Oh. But don't I, do that. <laughs> I, I, I've been practicing, and oh, you uh, have? I understand you guys might play the secret whistling codes we at the might. end of your show. We might. Uh, okay. I mean, I mean, you, you really, you might want to keep it a secret because you okay. don't want to give it to all the guys out there. They might oh, course, right. launch missiles or something. Right. That would yeah, be bad. but that's true. I ended up in solitary confinement for eight months. Because what had happened, at, at one point I was arrested and I ended up in court. Mm -hmm. And uh, I figured I was gonna get out on bail. My, my right. family was there. And then the prosecutor starts telling the judge, not only do we have to detain Mr. Mitnick, but we have to make sure he can't get access to a telephone. <laughs> because if he does, your honor, he can pick up the phone, call NORAD, right. <laughs> whistle the tones, and possibly launch a nuclear oh weapon. Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. And when this guy said it, I laughed in open court. Well, yeah. Because it's so it's so ridiculous. But the judge- Was NORAD even like online through the telephones at that time? I have no idea, I never looked. Yeah, hmm. mm. who knows? But mm. um, so the judge actually made an order that they had to ensure that when I was detained, yeah. that I didn't have access to a phone. So the only place they can put me was, was solitary. solitary. That was for eight and a half long months. That's horrible. I mean, yeah. you're not the kind of person I would I wouldn't generally think of seeing in solitary. No, it's usually like if you kill a prison guard, kill yeah, another inmate, yeah, you know, that, you're the Mexican mafia. <laughs> I don't think you're mafia, right? No. Okay. So, Kevin, you have wrote this book called Ghost in the Wires. Correct. Um, I've read it and I thought it was incredibly awesome. It's like oh, a sci-fi so thriller. Thank like you a, so much. Like a real life R.L. Neil Stevenson book <laughs> almost. But um, for anybody that hasn't read it, what's it about? Well, it's kind of about me and my adventures as a hacker. Yeah. Um, from when I was a 12 year old, my first hack was like hacking the bus system in Los Angeles. Yes. And that's awesome. You know, there's no you a lot of money. Yeah, it was no computers at the time. And I remember as a young kid, I was riding on the back of the bus. And in Los Angeles at the time, they would give you a transfer if you paid an extra dime. Right. And it was this piece of paper and it had uh, the, the driver punched holes. You no know, meaning like what bus line you are, what, yeah, yeah. what direction you're going. But it was a special punch. Every bus driver had like unique shapes. 
Not like when you go to the car wash and you yeah. got for 10, that oh, type yeah. of thing. I have so many rewards codes mm. for all the shopping that I do. Uh, Trust all me, the yogurts, I know about all the, all the, whole all the car washes. Yeah. <laughs> so as I'm, I was leaving the bus that day uh, and I, I, I walked by the driver. I go, hey, sir. And he goes, yes. I'm 12. Yeah. And they go, I'm working on this project in school and we have and to believe you. <laughs> punch these special shapes on cardboard and that punch is really cool. Where do you guys buy them? Right? <laughs> what kind of project would a 12 year old mm. be doing? I don't know. <laughs> I made it up on the fly, right? Because I wanted to get the answer. I wasn't going to say, hey. But you're I... totally innocent. So he believed you. Right. Believe me. He told right. me the name of the store. I borrowed 15 bucks from my mom and I go get the punch. But then the problem was, is where do you get the transfers? Mm -hmm. So. As a kid, I was thinking, after these guys drive a bus for eight hours a day, they're probably not going to clean the bus. Right. Probably some maintenance guy's going to do it. They're going to throw everything mm -hmm. in the garbage. So, so I rode on. my bike over to the bus depot, yeah. and this was my first experience with dumpster diving. And it was out in the public area, and I climb over the, the dumpster, and I pull myself over, and it was like a jackpot. It was all oh. these discarded books of transfers. That's awesome. And so I was riding around <laughs> Los Angeles for free. And I had no idea what I was doing was wrong because even when other people were waiting at the bus stop, yeah. I'd say, hey, I can punch you a transfer. And I used to punch transfers for people just oh, sitting at the well bus that's, stop. That's very good heart of, of you to yeah, do that. I mean, I, that's it was so a good nice. spirit. Yes, yeah. yeah, a good Samaritan. So you ended up going to jail for things that people thought you had done and, and going through a ton of court. And you even ended up in solitary confinement at one point. So yeah. um, that sounds like it'd be really hard to share with the world. So why did you write the book? Well, I. A lot of people really didn't know my story. There were three books written about me, The Fugitive Game, Take Down, mm -hmm. The Cyber Thief, and The Samarat. And they all got it wrong. You know, they pretty mm -hmm. much, you know, interviewed the police, yeah. interviewed people that were like former friends of mine that made up stories, like the NORAD story, for yes. example. <laughs> and I thought it would be great to get out my story because it was so interesting. And I spent my life kind of as a hacker. And I wanted to get the true story out. That's really That's the reason. And yeah. They made a motion picture about me that wasn't true called Take Down. And not I only was, the movie sucked. Movie. Don't I kind of want to see it. I kind of want to see it just to, just to laugh at it. <laughs> it's funny because I'm friends with one actress and one actor that played in, in, in oh, the movie are? in real cool. life now, Donald Logue and uh, Angie Featherstone. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the movie was just like horrid. I mean, uh, what ended up happening is I was in jail. And, oh. I and my attorneys negotiated with the motion picture company, Merrimax and Dimension mm -hmm. Films, to do script changes and all this other stuff and paid me a financial settlement because it was libel. So they didn't really talk to you about the script or anything? When no, you were up with it? they never oh, talked man. to me. They took it mostly from the book Take Town, which was untrue as well. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. terrible. <laughs> yeah, so how would you like that? You wake up one day and somebody's making a movie about yeah. you that's not hey, true, right? Hey, oh, that looks awesome, but no, you got that part wrong. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So there were a whole lot of security flaws for a lot of corporates, uh, a lot of companies that you had to write about in here. Did you run into any kind of problems with those companies when you were writing the book? No, because really? they, they don't know about the book until they go read it. I mean, everything is 100% true. Yeah. So I disclosed real names and real companies. Mm -hmm. And there's no defamation in the book. So as wow. long as it's true and it's not under any type of protective order, I could write about it. That's really surprising. I, I would have thought you had to go through a whole lot of, lot of like legalities to no. be able to write some of the things in there. I had to go through more legalities on using pictures. Like if it's Seriously? If I, yeah, like the, the pictures that yeah. are located in the middle? Oh yeah. Like wow. people that, where the pictures Please. were, yeah, where the pictures were uh, taken by another party, mm -hmm. I had to get releases, you know, signed releases, and I had to wow. go through a lot of trouble because in some of those pictures, I didn't know who, to, who took them. Yeah. Like there was one of a guy named Justin Peterson, who oh, was a government right. informant against me. And uh, that was Eric. Eric, Eric Hines. Hines, yes. And he was at SummerCon, and somebody else snapped the photo. So I found out who it was. Where was that picture? Right. Um, there this, it is. This one. Yeah. <laughs> I found out who it was, and uh, it took um, like such a, a surfer. long time. <laughs> and especially the one on screensavers when oh, I got yeah. off. Supervised release. They did a show, and I had to go because screensavers went, you know, to different companies. So right. I had to go to like to Comcast and trying to get them to legally release a picture is like, you know, buying How a house. Weird. Yeah. So was there anything that you couldn't write about the book in the book, yes. or any kind of like attacks that you wanted to talk about that you? Yeah, didn't I couldn't include? write about stuff that's under protective order because okay. as part of my case, the judge, because the government wanted it, mm -hmm. uh, put a protective order on stuff of stuff oh. I couldn't talk about. But there was other hacks because 
what actually happened is this book is 400 pages. Mm -hmm. I went way over word count. The book yeah. was only supposed to be 250 to 300. Really? And my publisher was going to uh, require me to take out a lot of this stuff, but they read it and loved it. Personally, I'm glad you included everything because yeah. it's like, interesting. One cool story is one of my social engineering, one of my favorite ones, is this is like, you know, rewind back to like 1984. Okay. And I was in Digital Equipment Corporation's network. And it, their I network. Even bored. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. I'm old. And their network was like my Disneyland, right? And I wanted to be able to sniff packets on yeah. this protocol called DeckNet. Okay. And so this one company in the San Fernando Valley, where I actually lived, developed a monitor sniffer tool for DeckNet. Okay. So I wanted to get a copy. And so I found out these guys ran their business out of, a, uh, out of a residence. It was like two guys. And they had a VAX computer. And I was thinking, well, how can I hack into it? Because when I dialed, well, I got the dial-up number. And when I dialed up, it asked for a system password. So there's no way I'm yeah. going to be able to con them that way. Yeah. So what I did is I got an update tape from DEC, repackaged it up, put, my, put a, basically a Trojan on the update tape, oh. repackaged it up, shrink wrapped it, put it in this box, and then I got a UPS uniform from a Hollywood uh, shop. Oh yeah, those are so easy to those find. Those are so easy, hat, <laughs> uniform, clipboard, and around seven in the morning, I knock on the door, the guy answers, he's, I woke him up, which was intentional, yeah. and I said, UPS, I have a delivery from Digital Corporate, can you please sign? <laughs> and I'm pushing awesome. myself into the door, yeah. and the reason why is, what do you think I didn't have that would give me away? Um, an ID? UPS truck. Oh, UPS truck, Right, no truck! Oh. Right. So it took about seven to ten days. Oh, you didn't buy a truck? No. No? I couldn't afford it on my 18, <laughs> it was like 18, 19 years old. Yeah. So, so what happened is eventually about after like a week, ten days, they installed the update and I got in. But uh, oh, that was kind of cool crazy. because it was like, it was physical, you yeah. know, and it was, it was kind of like James Bondish to me. It was Ooh. kind of like, you know, you know, could I really pull it off? Ooh, that, yeah. sounds, that sounds actually really fun. So were you wor worried about writing any of the different exploits that in you included No, I had here? to take down a lot of the technical exploits out. Oh, okay. And the reason being is we wanted the book to be available to the general public. I noticed yeah. that. Yeah, you made it really easy to understand a lot of the more technical hacking aspects that you included in it. Yeah, like the like legacy hacks like with .rhosts, yes. yeah. which doesn't really exist these days. But, you know, that I was able to explain and then I had different attacks because as it worked out, when one attack really works well, you just use it multiple times against right. multiple targets. Yeah, right. So works. if you have a zero day in Windows RPC or in you know Apache or IIS, yeah. you're not going to sit there and try to use a different exploit for each target. You're going to use the same uh, one over and over and over. So in a lot of the stories, I use them differently. Right, oh, okay. and and then I illustrate it, and it becomes f a fun read. Yeah, it because does. it was the cl you know calling up somebody over the phone, pretending to be the help desk saying that somebody reported a problem creating files with a period. Yeah. Oh. And then this guy, this, I this engineer <laughs> I goes, I, I said, uh, did you report it? You know, and, and no, but can we try it out? And I said, do you have a .arahus file? And the guy goes, no, like, what's no, that? What's, yeah. <laughs> I said, okay, let's try creating one. So I have him create the file, well, you know, so and it basically it. <laughs> allows me into a system. And I said, okay, it, it works. So I'm going to cancel the trouble ticket. Now you can remove the file. Oh, the guy's clueless awesome. and I got into his box. I mean, so it was all these different types of ways of using social engineering yeah. and technical hacks to get in. Wow, yeah. that's great. Now, speaking of people that you might have social engineered, and same with the people that might have accused you of things, did you worry about any of the people that you had written about in the book? Like, did they, did any of them confront you or anything well, like that? Well, one did. I was working for this lady named Elaine Hill at a law firm, her home, Roberts and & Owen, and this is when I was a fugitive in Denver. Yeah, and she was one of my that. bosses, right? <laughs> so she wrote me on LinkedIn, she goes, oh, hi, Eric slash Kevin, because I was under the name Eric Weiss, oh, the real name for Harry Houdini right. at the time. <laughs> and she goes, my husband is loving your book. And by the way, because I characterized her mm -hmm. as a school teacher personality, yeah. right? And she goes, you're not going to believe what I do today. And she told me that she's, she's now a school teacher. teacher. So she goes, you got me right on. That's so cute. <laughs> yeah. So, so now that the book is out, um, did any of those people, because you had a lot of people that had lied to get you in trouble, did any of them come up to you and say, hey, I'm sorry for saying no. that when they saw this book come out? No. Really? Not at all. No, no, none of my past. I would have. My, my, cool. my past uh, 
hacking partner who was, you know, hacking with me for a number of years yeah. and was Louis DePain. Mm -hmm. And he's not happy about the book because um, I wrote that he cooperated with the government, but, you know, he wanted to clarify with me that he was cooperating after my sentencing, so it would have had no effect on me. So he mm -hmm. was not really in an informant. So oh, okay. he, was, he was kind of disappointed. Uh, that I wrote about him in that way, but I just try to be a hundred percent, you know, frank yeah. and, and honest, you know, yeah, with the you're book. Just, you're... Domain com is owning the competition with cheap domain names and hassle-free service. Our Hack 5 fans are making Domain.com one of the fastest growing domain registrars in the world. And if you're setting up a website to show off your pictures of your cat, brag about your new voting skills, or do something business related, Domain.com is the best place to buy a domain name for your new idea. Domain.com's easy checkout process makes it simple to find your domain name and set up your website without hassles. Domain.com's domain discovery system quickly shows you available names, making it easy to select the domain extension that's right for you. Find a suite.com or get a .co and save a character. Already have a domain somewhere else? It's cool. Transfer it to Domain.com for only $7.61 and get an extra year free. The guys at Domain.com are huge fans of Hack5 and they want to hook up other Hack5 fans. Use the coupon code HAK5 and get 15% off your next domain purchase or transfer. It's only $6.47 for transfers. Don't forget, when you think domain names, think Domain.com. Okay, so you had so many fun hacks, and it just sounds like you had such a good time doing it. It was kind of a ball, but then again, it got more serious because yeah. I, my goal was to become the best at circumventing security. Mm -hmm. So You never I, made a dime off of any it of wasn't, this. It wasn't money. My, again, my, it was adventure, seduction of adventure, uh, curiosity, and challenge. So you never even wanted to make any money off no, of it? No, not like, really. You never I wanted to be the best at... I wanted an be, itch to do it? No, I wanted to be the Harry Houdini of awesome. like hacking. And uh, so I went after the source code of operating systems like VMS at the time mm -hmm. uh, and hacked into DEC and took a copy of the source code, you know, which is like a, you know, a serious offense. Yeah. But I, I was leveraging that source code to become better at hacking because oh. I could analyze it for bugs. I could look at developer comments. I could change the code and you know, patch, mm -hmm. patch system you know, binaries. Uh, and then when it be, eventually became a fugitive, I hacked into cell phone companies to get the source code so I could maintain invisibility. And I knew that it was important to maintain invisibility because right. when the FBI was chasing me, I was doing counterintelligence. I hacked into a, the cell phone company in Los Angeles called Pactel Cellular. Right. And there was this informant that was trying to set me up. So what I did is I was able to get access to the call detail records. So I searched, well, who calls this guy? You know, oh. who in Pactel Cellular calls this informant? And then I came up with a list of numbers, and I looked at their billing records, and it turned out they were calling nice. FBI internal numbers. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist Red to figure flag. out yeah. they're the feds. Yeah. So, you know, common sense, I should have stopped there. But I didn't have any common sense. So I have this device called a DDI, mm -hmm. a, a digital uh, data interceptor, where it allows me to monitor a cell site on the data channel and see who registers and see who gets calls. So I programmed in these numbers into this device at my office. I worked as a private mm -hmm. investigator. And I just let it sit there. And then like a month later, I walk into the office and I hear beep, beep, beep. I'm walking all signal. around the, the offices. Mm -hmm. and it's coming from mine. Uh -oh. like, what the hell's going on? Yeah. I look at my computer and it's my FBI early warning system has been tricked. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it turns out I'm that one so of the scared. agents, yeah, I was, I was you know, petrified. One of the agents had called a payphone number, and I knew that number, what it was. It was the payphone across the street from the apartment <laughs> I was living at. So I was thinking, Oh no! <laughs> I, that happened two hours earlier. I was sleeping. If the FBI come to arrest me, they would have. They would have just. They would have walked up. in. Yeah. yeah. And they wouldn't follow a hacker. Like why? Why would they follow me? They already know where mm. I work. So the next logical thing is they were there to do a search. In America, oh, they no. actually have to get a description of the premises. Right. So that night. I knew they were probably going to search the next day. That night, I you know moved out all my computer equipment, my floppy disks. You know back then, you know three and a half, you know three and a quarter floppy disks. You had a whole cat and mouse yeah, game going. Yeah, yeah. So That's I move awesome. all that stuff out, and then the next day nothing happened. Mm -hmm. 
So then I got a little bit bolder as I went to Winchell's Donuts and I got a big box, you know, 12 donuts. And I took a Sharpie oh, and yes. I wrote, I wrote FBI Donuts on the box of donuts. <laughs> I put it in the fridge. And then on a post-it note, <laughs> I write FBI Donuts inside, like the Intel, you know, Intel inside, <laughs> oh, FBI Donuts awesome. inside. <laughs> and it just so happens they raided me at six in the morning oh. the next day. And the only thing they found were FBI Donuts. Well, That's why they were mad at me. <laughs> And they didn't touch any. I don't know why. They left them all for me. Oh, well, that was nice of them. Maybe they thought they were, Maybe you were uh, poisoned afterwards. or something. I don't know. Of course. You're going to poison some, something. Well, you never know what they think. That makes think. sense. Yeah. So, I, I, personally, I don't think that the law quite understands uh, what it took to be a hacker back then. Do you think that they'd understand better now and maybe had given you more fair treatment? Well, it was kind of, you know, computers and hacking was kind of mysterious. Yeah. And they couldn't understand the nonprofit motive back then. So today we're post 9 11. Right. So they probably would have treated me worse. Oh. Yeah, who knows? But to be That's locked up point. in solitary confinement on some myth they could launch nuclear weapons, you know, who really knows? You know, I was kind of the guy. They wanted to make the example, yeah. to set an example for everybody else. If you hack, this is what the federal government is going to do to you. And in <laughs> fact, there was this guy uh, at Novell who I called up and convinced to set up an account on one of their terminal servers. And this guy, his name is Sean Nunley. And uh, he asked me to call his voicemail and leave the password I wanted, and I did. And he set up the account and I used it, but he never deleted that voicemail. And then when they figured out what oh, was going no. <laughs> on, when they figured out what was going on, they turned the, that voicemail yeah. over to Novell Security and went to the San oh, Jose. Crap. <laughs> San Jose police, yeah. but they play the recording. It's just a voice. They don't know what it is. So They're just they like, oh, solve it must it. be Nick. No, they couldn't solve it. They, they didn't know, you know, San Jose uh, Computer Crime Squad had no idea who I was, I guess. Yeah. So eventually it gets to the FBI in Los Angeles, and the, one of the agents plays the tape, immediately knows my voice. It. Oh, that's Kevin. Yeah. Calls up Novell, says, I have some no. good news. <laughs> I have some bad news. The good news is, your hacker is Kevin Mitnick. The yeah. bad news is we don't know where to find him. Oh. So what eventually happened is when I was arrested and they held me for so many years without trial, is Sean called up my attorney, no, talked to the prosecutors like, what's going on with the Mitnick case? And mm. how can you hold him for years without a trial? And one of the prosecutors tells him, according to Sean, is uh, we're gonna teach, we're gonna teach him a lesson and send a message and we know we're violating his rights, but we don't care. So Sean, that sounds so unlawful. Yeah, so Sean was shocked. So he called my lawyer, my defense lawyer, offering to help me. And this is the guy I conned. So now we're great friends today. I mean, uh, we're really good friends. He works for Fusion IO. That's awesome. And uh, I mean, it was just like wow. And he, he just he was appalled. And That's I didn't terrible. even know what was going on. I was just sitting in prison, wondering where the just where's the light out. at the end of the yeah, tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. It was a scary experience. Now, given that this book is kind of a look at your past days and hacking, is there anything that you regret, regret from the past days? Yeah, you know, you know, I manipulated and conned a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's not cool, right? It's not a nice thing to do, right. even though my objective was hacking. So I feel bad for if I caused anyone well, to lose their job. you were a young job. kid, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was an adult too. You know, I was doing this till I was 31. You know, so if I, you know, I don't know if anyone lost their job. You know, oh, you yeah. know I, I don't know what harm, you know, you know, that I caused to the individual. So, you know, I regret hurting anybody or causing any company's loss. Yeah. Because to me, you know, cyberspace was my playground. And I wasn't trying to hurt somebody. I was just trying to be the Houdini of hackers. Right. Now, how would you define um, black hats and gray hats and white hats? Is there any kind of line between them? And if there is, what place well, do you I don't think know you're who, at? I don't know who came up with that definition. I, I guess I'm, I, I, I guess once you're a black hat, you know, you can never get that black out. Right, so <laughs> you're, I'm probably gray, gray meaning yeah. that you know, hey, I did things illegally, and now, I mean, what? Where can you take an illegal activity mm -hmm. like computer hacking and legitimize it, right? That's true. So it's really cool because now I do the same thing today. Clients pay me a lot of money, and I get to break into their systems, and it's fun, and I so help them. So that's what you do now, right? Yeah. But it's kind of like Pablo Escobar becoming a pharmacist. <laughs> You know, I mean, where can this happen, right? That's a terrible way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what kind of techniques have you developed over 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 the past years to hone your kind of craft as kind of a social engineer? 
Well, I mean, I, uh, I love Dave Kennedy's social engineering toolkit. I mean, oh, he's taken yeah. that toolkit and made it easy, you know, before it's doing it by hand, using, you know, tools like Metasploit. Yes. Um, but, you know, a social engineering... We love Metasploit here in the Hack Factory oh, yeah. house. <laughs> it, it, it's it's, it's a, a fantastic tool. I agree. But a lot of it is, and it's, you know, simply by having access to a tool doesn't get you in. You have to really be meticulous at creating the situation where you're going to get somebody to fall for it and not realize to... after they click or to give you information over the phone that you know they made a mistake you kind of had to like be an actor almost yeah it's, uh, yeah exactly like That's i mean cool. one of the attacks in my book is uh this was actually on a pen test mm -hmm. and uh what ended up happening is i went to go buy i bought an hp printer and created the you know the cd uh had somebody you know do the art you know, and basically created yeah. with the drivers with a Trojan, right? Oh. Packaged it all up and called one of the executives at this company and told them I'm with the HP uh, Executive Early Adopter Program. We'd love to have you on the program. We're going to send you, would you like a free printer? And of printer? course, they're not going to say no. They're not going to say no. Yeah. And I reminded them it's very important because of a bug in, in I asked them, you know, what operating system is using. It was Windows. You know, if you're using Windows, you know, make sure you install the CD. They did it. <laughs> or, I mean, he did it. And... You know, it's coming up with the ideas because the attacker wants to get software mm -hmm. or malicious code on the box. They, you know, usually that's it. You know, like all the attacks today are using social engineering to drive a, a client side exploit in Adobe Flash and, you know, yeah. office documents and stuff like that. Or, you know, getting somebody to make a mistake, plugging in that USB drive, installing a piece of software. So you kind of think of a situation where it says where somebody wants something. And it seems so reasonable and the risk, you know, you open an HP printer and you see the CD mm -hmm. and it's, it looks exactly like HP's, you know, yeah. you're not looking at it for a counterfeit. Yeah. I mean, you're like, oh, that's like reasonable, real. right? Yeah. And it works. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, in, you know, in all the social engineering, well, both technical and social engineering pen testing that we've been doing since 2003, we never failed. Really? So wow. does that tell you that we're really good or does that tell you security is really bad? In my opinion, security is really bad. I agree. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Yeah, there is. So do you have any new projects coming up? Well, I finished my book. Uh, right now we have... Which was awesome. Right. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, uh, we have a uh, potential television series. Is There is what? You know, a huge, yeah, a huge uh, network that is sending the book to... Uh -oh. They sent the book to the have writers. Have you told anybody about this? Or no. <gasps> We're yeah. the first to hear. Yeah, but it's it's a it's it's a shot in the dark. You know that's Hollywood. That would so be right now really it's with cool the writers. Though. If the writers want to do it, uh, then they'll probably green light uh, a pilot to do a pilot, and uh, I might we might have a television series based on the book. I don't know. I'm cool. you know, praying. So I'm I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, that'd I be joined awesome. this uh, uh, company. It's not announced yet, but this company develops internet security awareness training. Nice. Uh, products because how do you prevent social engineering is in corporate environments you have to simulate attacks on the users mm -hmm. right so to inoculate them it's like having a flu shot right you don't want to get the h1n1 yep. so if they give you a little bit of uh, the, the virus you know your body builds that immunity yeah. same thing it's the same psychological idea with social engineering is you attack the users over a period of time yeah. you inoculate them now when the real attack comes they reject it so I'm uh, just joined this company uh, in, in an executive position to help create this product that will help nice. companies prevent the future Kevin Mitnicks from getting it. Oh, the future Kevin Mitnicks. The future Kevin Mitnicks. All the little ten-year-old ones out there. <laughs> yeah. So for the, those, no, the twelve-year-olds with the bus punch. Yes, for the twelve-year-olds <laughs> with the bus punch, yes. the budding hackers. Yeah. Do you have any kind of um, uh, best traits that you think that they should have, or any kind of? Um, well, think fast on your feet. Think you know, I, and to me. Hacking was all about the passion, right? I mean, I was just so, I agree. it was just something and I, I love to you're do. you're so passionate about it. It's right, awesome. I mean, it's like a sports, a guy that plays soccer goes out and practices, you know, eight hours a day. Yeah. It's because he wants to be the best soccer player. Yeah. Well, I wanted to be the best, you know, hacker at circumventing security because to me it was like magic. Because I actually started, and I mentioned it in Ghost in the Wires. Yes, you started that with that. How I started hacking was wanting to perform magic tricks. And right. then I met this kid in high school that can perform magic with the telephone. He was a phone freaker. So I got involved in this hobby, and one of my first phone freaker uh -oh. hacks, this is funny, was to um, uh, change my friend's home phone, another phone freaker, to a pay phone. So whenever <laughs> he or his parents 
were trying to make a call, you know right. what they would hear? What? Listen. The call you have made requires a 10 cent deposit. Please hang up momentarily, listen for dial tone, deposit 10 cents, and dial your call again. <laughs> so, so, That's great. So, so they'd hear this recording, my friend would call me, put it back, put it back, <laughs> my parents are going to kill me. So then you know what I do? Change it to a prison phone. Oh, so no. they can only make collect calls. You know, so I just <laughs> like playing with the system. I was a prankster. Oh, that's so funny. So if you could talk to your 12-year-old uh, your self now, what kind of, what would you say to him? Wow. Well, I mean, <laughs> the world has changed, right? I yeah. mean, from when I was 12. I mean, right now, everybody has access to tools, like your favorite one is Metasploit. They have access to technology. I mean, this did not exist. Yeah. You know, my first computer was in high school was an Olivetti terminal with an acoustic couple or modem at 110 baud. Oh my That's gosh. That's 10 characters a second, right? <laughs> you know, at that time, I think my dad had one of those. That's scary. <laughs> Showing my age again. So anyway, um, uh, a terminal, a VT100 terminal and a modem would cost you three or four grand. So it was unaffordable. Oh gosh, that's insane. Yeah, unaffordable for me to learn about technology. So what I used to do is roam through radio shacks in the San Fernando Valley yeah. and at college campuses trying to hijack computer time so I could learn about technology. Oh, that's so fun. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Now, right after the break, we are going to have some awesome viewer questions for you. I don't know what these are yet, so okay. be warned. But we'll be right back after this break. Computer disasters eventually happen to everyone, but if you get Carbonite Online Backup before your disaster, then no need to worry because all of your files will be backed up automatically and safely off-site. And getting them back is really easy to do on any computer or your smartphone or the Carbonite iPad app. You can access them anytime, anywhere, and with Carbonite Unlimited Backup for PC or Mac, it's just $59 a year. But if you use the offer code HAK5 when you start your free 15-day trial, you get two months free if you decide to buy. All the details are over at Carbonite Carbonite.com and remember to use the offer code HAK5 to get yourself two months free with purchase. And we're back and with us in studio at Hack5 today we have Kevin Mitnick and we are ready for some viewer questions but uh -oh. are you ready? I don't know. I'll, I'll take worry. it as they come. Don't worry. <laughs> they'll, they'll be pretty easy. All right. So the first one comes with, from Philippe or Philip. He asks, what do you think about the recent hacking activities of groups like Anonymous and the release of classified documents on the web like WikiLeaks? And how would you contrast that to hacking back in the day? Well, it's certainly a lot different from hacking back in the day. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, it's kind of like, like it, when, I, when I read about this stuff, I go, wow, you know, these guys have balls. Right? Yeah, no kidding. I mean, well, first of all, you know, I, I look at WikiLeaks really wouldn't be WikiLeaks without Bradley Manning. Mm -hmm. So without Bradley Manning handing over all those documents, if he in fact That's did true. it, yeah. nobody would even know who they are. Yeah. Right. So is it really Julian Assange or is it Bradley Manning? You know, so that's a question. But like groups like Anonymous, especially LulzSec, I mean, it's like in your face, right? Yeah. Well, we're going to go, we're going to do a DDoS attack against the CIA. Yeah, and, why not? Uh, are you allowed to use cuss words on this show? Oh, for sure. Oh, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, and today's fuck, you know, uh, fuck FBI Friday, you know, and stuff like this. And I'm going, and I, that's I, horrible. And, I, and I'm going, I wonder how long it's going to take before these guys are caught. And I'm, and I'm looking at their Twitter feed. You know, and so, you know, other like 300 other thousand people. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking at the times they tweet, you know, the, the type of oh. language they're using. And I kind of pinned it like, I think these guys are in the UK. Oh, right? yeah. And uh, yeah. <laughs> eventually there was like two guys arrested in the UK that were like leaders of the group. And it, it didn't surprise me. They're like 19, 20 years old. Yeah, of course. But the sophistication they're of their ballsy. attacks, right? They're using uh, uh, low orbit ion cannon to do d d denial of service attacks. That's stupid because that's doing a full TCP handshake, right? <laughs> so there's no way to spoof your source address. Right. Right. So I'm thinking that's kind of stupid. And... <laughs> You know, and then more sophisticated uh, users or members of Anonymous or LulzSec are, you know, really exploiting SQL injection. So again, that goes to the answer, with, even with myself, was I really that good or are the security that bad? So I really think it illustrates there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there. Right. 
you know, tremendous amount. I mean, look at Sony. What were they hacked? 22 times? Oh, my God. I, mean, I don't even know. <laughs> I stopped uh, counting a long time yeah, ago. <laughs> I bet their CSO is having a bad day. Of course, oh. there's different, you know, subsidiaries of Sony. Right. They're getting compromised. But, it's, you know, it's just like they, they went wild after Sony, right? And just That's true. took them down. I don't know if it had to do with George Holtz and that whole suit against him for cracking the PS3 or if it was just, you know, hey, this is a cool target. Right. Cool. Well, thank you, Philip, or Philippe, however you say your name. <laughs> the second question comes from Nate. He says, who do you look up to? Harry Houdini. Of course, uh, yeah. Harry. Bruce Lee is one of my idols. I really look really? up to Steve Wozniak. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, the guy the guy is an amazing guy. He actually did the foreword in my book. Right, Which yeah. was amazing. That was really good. I wasn't expecting he would agree to it, but he did. Um, you, know, you know, kind of, again, you know, um, I like the spy type of genre type stuff, but really, like, Harry Houdini, because I love magic still mm -hmm. today. Um, uh, Bruce Lee, because, you know, he like the ninja, you know, of course. <laughs> martial arts. And people like Waz, who are like uh, engineers and, you know, change the world. You know, yeah. people even like Steve Jobs. I never met the guy, but he's, you know, created, you know, I mean, in my pocket, I have an MP3 player, I have an internet browser, and I have a yeah. telephone all in one device. Yeah. I mean, without him, you know, being the captain of the ship. I might not have that in my pocket. You might not have this laptop that you That's right. On. Yeah, same thing. All right, thank you, Nate. The next question is from Andy. He says, what are your views on the U.S. government laws like SOPA that limit our rights as citizens of the Internet? Well, it doesn't surprise me, but it's, it's a law, from my understanding of it, I didn't look at it in depth, mm -hmm. that has no due process. So what I understand I agree. is if there's, yeah. you know, an infringement that the executive branch determines, you know, their... You know, they're, they're the, you know, judge and jury, right, and executioner. You know, if they determine that something is, uh, violates copyright, they could sit there and interfere. You know, yeah. uh, basically it's stop bad. DNS resolution. <laughs> and I think that's terrible. And once, as we learned, once as Americans we give up rights, like the Patriot Act, they usually stay. And, we, you know, we, they just, they're forever gone. You never get them back. <sighs> You know? And what even surprised <laughs> me, and I, I, tw I tweeted this the other day, is there was a law passed in Illinois, but I think it was recently reversed, where it was actually a felony to record the police. Like if you watch the, you know, you see the police officers beating a guy and you're with yeah, your iPhone you have recording, your cell phone it. recording it. Yeah. Said, this guy was facing 75 years in prison. So I tweeted, I go, this is proof that we're actually in a police state. That's amazing. Thank God, from what I understand, a, a judge struck that down as unconstitutional. Good. But just in that one state doesn't mean these other states that pass the same law. Yeah, they might It hasn't been following. tested yet, so someone has to get arrested, get a lawyer, and, <sighs> you know, jump through all those hoops. Let's hope that doesn't happen. All right, the next question is from Jutsi. He says, Kevin, in your book you describe your hacking as an addiction, and it is constantly your downfall, downfall and your savior. How would you describe the insatiable itch <laughs> of hacking? Well, I, I, I'm still a hacker today. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, you know, and to me, it was like a complete passion. I don't know if you can call it an addiction um, or an obsession or just passion. You know, I'm not a psychologist, but I just was compelled to do this because I loved it so much. Right. And, uh, you know, and it drove me. And even today, again, I do the same thing, except I do it with authorization and I get paid for it. But it's still, I love hacking. The only, you know, and pen testing, the only yeah. thing that is kind of the downside is I have to do a report. Oh, so the report is no, paperwork, re but damn. And that's the deliverable, <laughs> right? So you're having fun, you know, figuring out all these vulnerabilities. You still got to work. Web apps, <laughs> in, you know, in people, in physical security. Yeah. And then you have to write a very, you know, smart looking professional report. And that's kind of like the work part. That's like, <laughs> oh, okay, I got to, you know, I got to do the deliverable. I guess it has to happen now and then. All right. This one is from a anonymous entry. He said, when you were a fugitive, what was the deciding factor for when to leave a place? Uh, where I, when I was a fugitive, if there was any sort of risk. Now, when my first place I went to was Denver. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the book, in Ghost of the Wires, you'll read that I actually was fired from my job at the law firm because they thought I was consulting on firm time. Right. Because I'd always be on lunch on my cell phone. Yeah. They didn't realize I was like running from the government. And, and at they, the time, cell And I wasn't even paying so for my cell phone calls, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... And then I decided, well, it would be too risky to set up new identity in the same place. So I basically threw a dart. Uh, well, I threw a dart, and then I decided to look at Money Magazine <laughs> to pick my new place. So, so I would, anytime I perceived risk, right. and I would set up these early warning systems. Like mm -hmm. when I was at the law firm, right. I one of my jobs was supporting their telephone system 
uh, for client matter billing. And so I put in some code into their system uh, that if anyone in the law firm called the FBI in Denver or LA or the U.S. Attorney's Office in Denver and LA, it would send a page to my cell, uh, not to my oh, uh, pager. Yeah. So I'd have this early warning system. It was tripped twice. I was like freaking out, but it turned to be a false alarm that they were calling the civil division. Oh, that's but, good. <laughs> so I always like, you know, I was like one step forward, two steps back type of thing, or two steps forward, one step back. So I'd constantly be setting up these early warning systems. And if there was if there was any a time where I should have like stopped and got out was in Raleigh, where I was eventually arrested. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree. But oh well, I guess it's, it happens. <laughs> if I wasn't, if, if it didn't happen, if, if uh, destiny didn't take me there, I probably would never be on the show. That's true. Maybe I'd be still living out there running. Oh Who knows? man, and then we would have never met. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is from <clears throat> Anonymous Coward. Sounds War like a games? slash dot. <laughs> it might be. War games, the net, or hackers? <laughs> War games. Nice. Good or, choice. No, or sneakers, I think is a, oh, a really good one. Yeah. You know, I never saw sneakers, but I saw the oh, net. You gotta go I'm a fan of You, you, you have to. Net. It's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's good. And I want to see uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo is coming out. The Swedish film is going to be. The Swedish uh, version is it, awesome. Okay, I haven't seen it. <laughs> I'll have to go rent it. See the original. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but the <laughs> English version is supposed to be out in December. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so I'm really excited to see that. That's, that's going to so be really this, good. So you got this, you know, hot chick hacker. Okay, cool. Let's go. Why watch not? That. Yeah. Yeah, that's always a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Coming up soon, we'll be answering your viewer questions. But first, I have to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, it's, it's, thank it's you been so awesome. much. Awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, and you, I mean, you know, you're always welcome back. We could go war driving or beer or whatever yeah that would be fantastic <laughs> you know I'll, I'll you know i could borrow your antenna over there and we could you know hook right, it up and, nice little you know, see, what, uh, see how far you can get see how far we maybe can the get. coffee exactly. shop downstairs never know yeah there's Won't a starbucks close Shh, don't say anything. all right we're gonna take a break and then we'll check in with darren with for the nibble If you love alternative apparel brands like Kid Robot, Hurley, and Stussy, but you hate wasting cash, get this. You could score these premium brands at up to 80% off every day at Jack Threads, the invite-only shopping club for guys. They're serving up street, skate, and surfwear brands at brain-melting prices. Best of all, Hack 5's hooking you up. That's right, skip the wait list and join free at jackthreads.com slash H-A-K-5 to start saving instantly without having to leave the house. It's time once again for the nibble, and I gotta thank Razor for writing in. He says, I was watching one of the latest episodes, and you mentioned how important it was to make sure you use two wakas, or at least that's what I call them, greater than, instead of one greater than when appending files from the command line. And I thought you might like to know about this little option for bash. It's set tack o no clobber. This command makes it so that you have to override the use of with the waka in order to actually replace the file. So you can actually do so by typing waka bang instead. And if you tried to type like echo blah into a text file, it'll actually give you an error saying that the file can't be replaced. And you know, you just go ahead and put it with a waka bang and it'll allow you to append. So here, let me give you an example. So if I like echo tech and um, hello into um, clobber me, and then cat clobber me, we'll see that it says hello. And as we know, if I echo uh, world into clobber me with two wakas, and then again, cat clobber me, I get hello world. That's fantastic. But now if I set this option, set tack o no clobber, and then try to, I don't know, echo bunch of gobbledygook into clobber me. There we go. I can't overwrite the file that already exists. Thank you so much. If you guys have four bits you want to send by, hack5.org slash nibble, we'd love to hear from you. And it's time for my favorite part, the trivia. Ooh, what do we have and this week? And Technolist Photo of the Week. Oh, yeah, those are both yeah. good. Mm, yeah, deliciousness. So the Technolist Photo is from Steinar. He sends us a photo of someone, hmm, someone, hacking in a hotel room with their Wi-Fi adapter from the Hack Shop. What? Hackshop.org. I'm sure he kept it under uh, 20 dBi. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. You saw all the stuff that was going on on his computer. No worries. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to this week's trivia question. 
Last week's trivia question was, what were the safe words uttered by Simon to calm the river? Oh, you know what? I actually forgot. Um, but I do know that I want a OD bar. Does that, does that count for anything? No, after the show. All right. We've had enough chocolate as it is. Okay, the answer was, I probably am going to pronounce this wrong, Eta Koram Nas Mech. Did we actually get any winners for that? You know a few people got it right. I think there might be some people with coats of brown. I was, yeah, I think so. All, All right. right. This week's question is, when calling the LAPD organized crime unit, what password did Kevin Mitnick, social engineer out of a lieutenant named Billingsley? I don't know. It comes that straight one. out of the book. I'll All give right. you that much of a hint. Where can they answer? They can answer over at hackfive.org slash trivia for a chance to win some awesome swag. Of course. And uh, if you're not lucky enough to win some swag, you can go and buy some over at the hack shop, H A K shop.com. We'd love to. Your business actually totally what's supports. New? Um, what's new? Mm, the duckies are back. USB rubber ducky? Yeah, yeah, we got those. I think. Don't, don't do oh. that on TV. Do what? Oh, Never mind. And we also have um, um, the new Wi Fi pineapple t shirts. Oh, yeah, those are really, really freaking awesome. They're adorable! Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you should go get one because they're awesome. Yeah, uh oh, you wanna. You wanna Oh no. Thanks, Jason. He's got the candy. They're and right. you can also we'll follow us later, on Twitter, Google Plus, <laughs> Facebook. Uh huh. Uh huh. Are you listening? No. Gosh. Twitter, Google Plus, Facebook, all that stuff you can find over at hackfive.org slash follow. And you can also find all the download links, iTunes and WMBs, whatever, WMBs. of our show. <laughs> WMB's. We don't have those anymore? No, 2008 <laughs> called it once it's format Sorry. back. My bad. Anyway, <laughs> we'll uh, see you guys next week. I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. Trust your technolust. Bye. I'll see you on the XVID. Candy? No. That was the most half assed throw I've ever seen you do. You're like, <laughs> boom. <laughs> Yeah, this is what I have to work with. If you'd like to take snubs from us, write 548 Market Street. <laughs> Send postage to, I will take snubs off your hand. Please put her in a FedEx box and put some holes in it. And... 548 Market Street, North 39371. Ah, it's big, it's heavy, it's hard. It's locked! It's locked! It's better than bark! It's good! <laughs> oh, you heard it from the horse's mouth. You know that shit like I know the bare necessities. It's the bare necessities. Actually. It's been the Shannon Show with more Shannon. So about those uh, missile codes, by the way, can you really whistle those? I can. You I have, want me to I have you a phone. Have? Do you want to use my phone? Yes, please. Okay. How about this one? Um, okay, it's modern. It's uh, no dial. Yeah, we're ready? Yeah. All right. <gasps> oh my god! That's awesome! <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody. Okay, I won't. Yeah, yeah, I don't don't worry. It's not recording. Air.